So we'll see in the workshop uh, how to sandbox application and especially um, common line um, application. Um, so we will use a uh, old vulnerable version um, because it is useful to see how it works and how an exploit might uh, well get access to your data. Um, <clears throat> So I hope everyone followed this uh, setup. If you didn't, you should still be able to do that, that right now, but uh, that might be a bit short. Anyway, um, if you didn't, uh, you can flash this uh, QR code, or follow this URL, and everything is explained there. Um, also a reminder, these uh, slides are available on the um, well, on the schedule. So you might want to download the PDF and to keep it uh, close. Because I will try to switch between these slides and a terminal, so yeah. So if you did follow this step, um, so Vibrant install a new machine, great. You can connect uh, through SSH, background like SSH, uh, but now you need to shut down this machine because I edited uh, the repository this morning. So just power it off. You do a git pull on um, the Vagrant repository that you just clown. <coughs> you do a Vagrant up and Vagrant SSH again. And then you'll, you'll get um, well, updated files. Um, if you miss that, it's OK. You can do that later. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I guess everyone did that already. Um, so if you don't know, there's a feature uh, with Vagrant that enables you to do snapshots. Um, and well, that might be useful to restore a previous state that was working, for instance. You should not um, use, well, you should not, uh, you're not required to use the feature, of course, but. Uh, that's kind of free. And then you can do an SSH, uh, background SSH, and connect to the machine. <clears throat> if you have a video manager installed, you can also launch it and see the video machine. Uh, but it will be more convenient uh, to use SSH. So, <clears throat> what did the prisoning um, if you execute the, if you executed the setup script? It first build the environment, uh, so with uh, an up-to-date um, Arch Linux distro. Install all the required packages. Installed um, a vulnerable version of Image Magic, which is not easy to find, but it's still there. Um, then the setup created a new package and installed it. So now let's see how to sandbox this kind of stuff with Sandbox. Are you supposed to be presenting something on the Oh, yes, I am. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> maybe you should start again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It was connected and it was okay. So we'll start again quickly just uh, for the one which are uh, online. Um, oops. <clears throat> yeah. That's basically what I said. Um, it will be easier to flash this QR code now. Um, and yeah, so what you can do is go to the background repository, do a git pull, background app, and background SSH to get the latest version. <coughs> but if you don't do that now, it will, you could do it later. 
No, everything is written in the um, readme, so you have all that. And uh, let's start for real. So, uh, first, why do we want to send back some application? Uh, well, to assume that with enough skills and time, uh, well, most applications could be compromised. So that includes the kernel, of course, but also all the space applications. And as developers, um, <clears throat> well, we don't want to be involved in such issues. So it might be a good idea to kind of prevent that. Uh, this is some kind of insurance. So you want to protect users. And even if there's a bug in your application, because there is somewhere, uh, well, that could um, make such an attack more costly. So uh, it will give more time to uh, update your application, fix it, update, and push uh, it over the fleet or distros or on GitHub, whatever. And yeah, as users, well, um, when you use an application, you can decrease your attack surface. So um, yeah, it will be nice to be able to control this attack surface. Simple example is as a Linux user on your desktop instance or on a server, uh, when you launch an application, even a common line application, well, it runs uh, most of the time with the same credential as the user. Um, so in this case, if this application is compromised, well, you can have access to all your files. Um, you might have, <coughs> you might have, well, a hidden distro uh, with Linux, Apamor, Smart Tomio, whatever. That's great, but I guess it doesn't cover everything because it is really complex. And if you want to install whatever application you want, uh, well the system-wide policy needs to be aware of that. So most of the time, it might not. Anyway, it's most flexible and it's fun. So sandboxing is really to isolate an application, to isolate process from the rest of the system, to not let him harm or access your data. Um, yeah, even in a just trusted application, processes can become malicious. So need to be careful, and you don't want to give privileges to your application to be able for it to drop some uh, more accesses. And you don't want uh, this can feature to harm your system either. And Unlock is designed just for that. It is an approach uh, Linux City module, uh, so available to everyone. There is mainly, well, there is three dedicated syscalls for that to configure security policy and to load it and to enforce it on the current thread. And still getting new and new features of the time. So um, when you update your kernel, you might get new features if you ask the kernel to use them. So uh, thanks to this syscalls. OK, so this workshop is focused on the file system um, access control. Um, basically, you can control which file uh, an application or process can execute, read, read or write, uh, which directory uh, allowed to be read, and where you can create files, directories, or uh, character devices, or stuff like that. So let's see an example. Um, let's say there's one first sandbox. Uh, which is kind of a genic one. So it only configures the security policy to allow, for instance, uh, read and execute on the slash user, and to only allow um, read to slash etc, and so on. So it's quite generic. But it might be, for instance, um, enforced when a user logins. So um, every application the user will launch after that uh, will be restricted by this first layer of sandboxing. Let's say the user wants to uh, well, launch a new application. Uh, let's say it's an image magic instance or any uh, picture application. 
Well, the application can force also a new security policy on itself. And this policy well, should be kind of tailored to its own use, to the code of the application. And because the application knows uh, which files it should, it should have access to, well, it can say, um, well, allow access to uh, .cache.config and the picture directory. But when this application open a file, actually, it can also further restrict its own sandboxing by adding a new layer, a third layer in this case. And that might be, for instance, uh, to only allow read uh, to the specific file that is requested to be opened by the user and to still have access to the cache because, well, that might need uh, required. And how does this work? So let's say that we can actually open the cool.jpg file here. So the first layer grants this access uh, for read uh, access, so it's okay. But we need to have the same approval for the two first layers too. So the kernel goes through the hierarchy and looks for the second layer and it finds that the second layer um, granted access to the picture state with, so it's okay. So let's go for the first layer now and the kernel go back to the front directory and find that, well, the first layer grants access to the home directory. So that's okay. Everything is checked and uh, the access is allowed. Okay, so how to sandbox an application? Uh, well, first you need to define a threat model. You need to know what is potentially malicious or not, what is trusted or not. Most of the time, um, well, application configuration should be trusted because it changed the behavior of the application, but input files like pictures, um, everything that, that the application can ingest from the, the network or the file system could be harmful. Uh, then you need to identify some part of the code that are meaningful and where there is kind of good chance uh, that is some bug. For instance, uh, file parsing. Uh, in this case, in the case we will see, um, it's when um, the image parser of image magic path the image and then do some steps that you should not do. Then we need to identify uh, where is this code and where we can patch it, actually. Um, and if possible, where the application already loaded its configuration. So this way, the application knows what is legitimate to be allowed to access, and all every, everything else should be denied. And then, uh, well, you can do that uh, in an in incremental way. You can well, identify other parts of the code and make it more generic um, to well, get more security guarantees. Uh, there's something to keep in mind. I will not talk too much about that, but it's it's important anyway. Um, it's forward, well, backward compatibility is uh, ensured by the kernel, but because Nanak is gaining more and more features over time, and because it is a deterministic mechanism, you need to ask for a specific feature before being able to use it. So. This means that if you develop an application uh, that should be run on a new kernel, and so using a new feature, if well, this feature is not available on another system with an older kernel, um, that might not work. So there's mechanism in place to handle that. And uh, well, there's some responsibility uh, for the developer to be sure that uh, well, the application will work well. Um, and the main idea here is to probe for an ABI version. So uh, with one of the non-log syscall, you can ask the kernel to give you a number. And this number will change with increment when the kernel will get new features. And to know which feature, you need to take a look at the documentation. 
So at runtime, you can check which features are supported and knows what should, you should ask and what you cannot ask to the kernel. This way, you can implement sandboxing in a best default uh, way that, that should protect the user as much as possible. So how does it work? Um, so for this, we use a, a first syscall, which is called landlock create toolset, with a specific flag, so the landlock create toolset version. And with this call, we get the ABI version. So if it's uh, less than zero, this means that the kernel doesn't support landlock at all. Otherwise, it means that it supports either the full set of Linux features or a subset of them. Then, um, when you know the kernel supports Linux, you can create a rule set. And for that, you need to specify which access rights you want your sandbox to be able to restrict. So this is part of the compatibility contract. In this case, well, you tell the kernel um, the sandbox will by default deny execution, uh, writing to files, creating new files, and so on. And then you can add exceptions to allow some specific files, file key, to well, be allowed. So to create this rule set, you fill this truck to this syscall, the analog create rule set syscall. Um, yeah. So it's an um, extensible attribute, so this might grow over time. And then you get a file descriptor. That's a real file descriptor, it's not a file, but it's a file descriptor that can be used then to populate this rule set. And to populate this rule set, you first define a rule, so that would be an exception. And you say, well, for instance, um, I want to, well, this path to be executable. For instance, slash user, you want it to, well, you want to execute applications that are in this directory. So you first define a set of access rights, and then you define the root of this hierarchy. In this case, slash, slash user. So you open this directory, uh, you fill the file descriptor in this struct, and then you pass this struct to a new syscall, which is called uh, landlock add rule. The first argument is the rule set file descriptor, and then, uh, well, you pass the rule, so you populate the rule. And when you're done adding all your exceptions, all your rule, all the stuff that your application needs to have access to, then you can enforce this rule set on the current set. And for that, most of the time, you'll need to uh, kind of pledge to the kernel that you will not get more privileges. Uh, one way to get more privileges is to execute set to id binaries. So that will not be allowed, except if you run as root, which is kind of special and might not be a good idea. Anyway, after that, once you're ready, you can call a third syscall, which is landlock restrict self, with the rule set file descriptor, and then from that point until the end of the thread and all its uh, child, um, this thread will be restricted and the sandbox cannot be uh, removed. Okay, let's patch image magic. Um, just a quick reminder. Um, image magic, I say, it is pretty common. Um, it is a set of tools to manipulate images, pictures, uh, to transform them and display them. And it can handle a lot of file formats. Uh, most of the time it is used as a tool in command line, but it might also be used for, well, by uh, servers, web servers and so on. Um, that might not be a good idea, but that's a fact. Um, so the attack scenario is uh, what was called image magic, image tragic. Um, so it was some years ago. Um, the issue is that um, there is, um, well, some image formats are quite flexible and they include uh, some URL to get some um, scheme kind of. Some 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 
extra information, metadata, to, the, to complete the understanding of the file. And that was, in a nutshell, passed to, um, um, well, um, a tool um, like curl or wget. So uh, I can find that it's not safe, and it could lead to a shell, um, uh, shell escape. So, and that was the case. Um, okay, and what we do is to use this version, test it, and then patch it, and then test it again to see what happened, even if, if the exploit is uh, used. So here's the agenda. We'll quickly switch uh, to another laptop. Okay, um, so yeah, I'll try to switch between the slides and the console. Um, so yeah, um, did all of you or most of you uh, downloaded the PDF, the slides? Yeah, that might be useful. And yeah, as a reminder, and it is written there, uh, what we are doing now uh, is, um, well, these changes are in, in the patches in the repository, so you already have these patches. Um, so it's just in case, or if you want to get back to that later. But uh, of course, it is not to apply these patches, um, otherwise it will be done in, uh, in two minutes. Uh, but you understand how, how it works and what they do. Um, so, yeah, uh, spoke a bit about that, um, but the different steps we need to do and what we'll do is first to declare uh, landlock syscalls because, um, as you may know, um, a syscall is mainly um, an ID, a number, and it might not come with an uh, .h, an API header. And most of the time, uh, libcs provide these kind of feeders, but uh, in the case of Landlock, like other new syscalls, it is not the case. So uh, it would be more convenient to write uh, like a simple shim around that. Um, yeah, then we'll take a look at where we want to patch it. Well, I will help you with that because uh, that might take a bit of time to understand an application, especially when it's not yours, of course. Uh, then we create a rule set, a static rules, a dynamic rules, and then finally enforce everything. We might not do that in this order because we'll try to test as much as possible. And yeah, let's start. Um, yeah, first you can go in this directory. Um, so it's a main one that contains uh, uh, the source code. Um, so on my system, it's it's here. So I like to okay. Okay. So I guess it's okay. So we end the good way to the good repository, and now that you updated your uh, uh, Vagrant script repository, we can update, well, launch this first script. Um, it will initialize um, image, the image magic uh, source directory to make it easy to work with Git. So, um, so yeah, I can go there. Uh, I grant uh, image matching patches in it repo. And I don't have that, so I need to update it. It's okay. Uh, 
it's work even better if I have internet. So I guess I will do like you, I will start again. Um, This one is good. Um, so you see that. Um, Vagrant automatically thinks the files. Okay, um, so let's go into this directory, image magic, trying source image magic, and there's no ATRC, so it says typo here, but we're good. Um, so let's execute this script. Okay, good. So I cheated a bit. I already have a rip setup, set up, so um, can just ignore that, but yeah. That's it, so I have, like you, this commit. Um, yeah, I guess it's not the same name, but um, that's it. Okay, um, let's switch to the next part. Um, then we'll need to copy a kind of a skeleton with the syscalls and uh, change it a bit. So uh, let's do that. So for the newcomer, we are in this repository. The PDF is in, uh, on the website. Um, Okay, let's copy this sandbox.c. So if you want to take a look, it's exactly the file which is provided by the kind of sources. Um, so, and the one that I used in the previous talk. Okay, so let's copy that into magic slash landlock. And then um, change a bit this file. So the main thing we want to remove is, well, the main function, of course, because uh, well, that, that should only be a kind of header library. Um, so we remove everything after that. Um, we might want to keep uh, these two definitions here. Um, there is accessfs roughly read and roughly write. So um, this groups, um, well, mostly reads accesses and mostly write uh, accesses. So that, that will help us after that. And you can remove all the rest of the C code. Um, except the two syscall definitions at the top, the three syscall definitions at the top. So if you look again, there's landlock read rule set here, landlock add rule, and landlock restrict self. All the rest is kind of optional. Um, the define, these two define will be useful. Um, so let's save that. I'm using Vim. I guess not everyone is using Vim, but you can use whatever you want. Um, if you want to start something, you can do uh, sudo um, uh, like sudo pacman uh, and install whatever you want. OK. No, 
Now we are, we'll look at um, the code of one tool of ImageMagick, which is called Convert. So I guess you get it. It's to convert from one file format to another. So let's open this file. It's wend convert. So I guess you you get the joke. Okay, and now, well, we'll not uh, look too much at this code because well, there's a lot. Um, but I look at it before, and I know where um, is kind of the sweet spot to patch it. So I will tell you, uh, you can look for copy magic string. There's only one instance. And just after this line, we will add our code. So the first thing to add is to create um, a rule set. Um, yeah, I guess it's okay for everyone. Um, so yeah, let's define a rule set. So we we create a new strict uh, variable, um, and I will set eighty tier. So let's call it will set eighty tier, and had uh, handled access FS with, you guess, uh, everything that we want to handle. So everything that will be denied by default and everything that can be uh, allowed by rule also. So uh, we'll use what was defined in the other file. So access FS roughly uh, read. And the same for write. OK. So you should add something of that. Um, and let's first try to um, test it. Um, but I forgot to. First, I guess you, you did it, but uh, we might do it again to exploit the install version. So let's launch, launch a shell. Um, um, so yeah, convert is already installed. Here we are changing, well, modifying a new version. So we can call uh, the install one, which is vulnerable. Um, with the exploit uh, file and try to write it, uh, change it from MVG, which is kind of a uncommon file format, to uh, PNG. So this works, and well, this works. I can tell you that it works because there's uh, an image here. And what you can see, when you so I guess before, is that there's also something else which is printed. It's a USSH key, so it's a SSH key in the virtual machine, of course. Um, but yeah, that's the one, this one. Um, so uh, yeah, that was generated when you created your virtual machine, so it's unique and it's not used anywhere. But in your real laptop, I guess you have this kind of keys. So you don't want this, well, first to be printed on screen, but that, that is really an example. But if, it's, if it can be printed here, uh, well, it can be uh, uploaded anywhere. And same for your personal pictures, for uh, any key you can have, any code, anything. So um, we change a bit uh, the convert source code. And 
only added this uh, rule set definition. But it's not enough. We need to, well, if you build with that, we'll tell that it doesn't know the land line rule set ATTR uh, type because it doesn't know where to look. That's OK. We need to add at the top to include the file we just uh, imported. So when dot, dot landlock, I'll put that here. So now that should be OK. It is not because it is not in one, it is in magic. Magic and lock. And the build should be, I guess it should be quite quick um, because you build it before. Um, but if it's not, uh, the next one will be uh, much more quick. So that's it. Uh, we have a long lock defined, but it's not used anywhere. So um, let's use it. So what is status here? Do you all have the convert tool compiling well? No issues? Great. Um, yeah, now we need to add, to use this rule. Um, so like this, we'll call the non create rule set with the rule set ATT that we define. And we'll get a file descriptor. And then, if everything is OK, uh, we'll use this file descriptor. Uh, but yeah, first, let's create this file descriptor. Um, so yeah, let's define all the variables um, as soon as we need them. It will be easier. In case you're wondering, uh, there's a zero um, at the end, and that is a flag. And that is mostly not used, except uh, it is kind of a trick, but to get the long version. But over time, we could get new features, and we, well, this flag could, well, this empty flag could get new flags. Empty argument, I mean. OK, so we should be good now. Uh, let's check if uh, this rule set is OK. So if there's an error instead. So if there's an error, let's print something. OK, and in this case, let's return and let uh, exit the program. So magic fault is just one, I guess. Um, not sure if we have that somewhere, but it's yeah. It's used as a way. You can see that here too. So okay. Now we should have our file descriptor. Uh, we can test that to be sure. Um, let's bring a uh, debug stuff. Um, yeah, just printf. Um, the rule set was created. Um, well, you can print it if you want. Okay, something like that. Um, okay, let's build that again. Okay, and now let's execute the same command that we did before, um, but this time we are with our own version of uh, uh, convert. So it's in utilities, convert, then you can take the same input image, 
um, background uh, exploit malicious and write that here. So it should do the same. Yeah, it works, it still works. Uh, it's okay, there's no sandboxing in force yet. We just created a file descriptor. And you can see that here. We set a file descriptor, uh, and the file descriptor is free. Great, let's move on. And yeah, at the end, we should close this file descriptor, of course. It's not a security risk, but it will be a file descriptor leak, so yeah, it, it is always good to close stuff to avoid uh, resource leaks. Uh, yeah, so yeah, let's cl close it now, maybe, uh, to not forget. Um, but we'll put that at the end here. So uh, as you can see, oops, um, at the bottom right you can see the patch name that contains this stuff. So you can either take a look at the patch or even apply it if you want. But yeah, you should try to write it yourself. Um, now let's enforce it. And what do you think will happen if we enforce this rule set as is? We have some idea. I gave some clues. We have a rule set that restricts all read and all write operations and allows nothing. So everything, all this action will be denied. So we can test that. Um, yeah. So Let's call the first syscall, PSCTL, so it's kind of a bit special, but if you use seccomp, you know it, because it is required for seccomp2. Um, PSCTL, PR set no new briefs, and set it to one. The other arguments are just not used. Is there an issue? Let's print that. Okay, and let's do the same for actually uh, the Lanag syscall. So Lanag rest itself. Um, so there's um, a typo in the slide. It's not a SRV because there's no SRV available, um, but it's will set FD. And in this case, um, because it should not happen, let's e exit if there's uh, an issue here. Um, so it's not restricted here, it was to lock reaches. Okay, and now, as before, let's return magic fault. Okay, so now to summarize, we have, we define a rule set. We created the rule set. We call PRCTL. And we enforce this rule, tech, this rule set on the current thread uh, with this syscall. So let's build that again. And there's typo here. So. Better now. Okay. And now let's launch, launch it again. TTDs, convert. Let's take the malicious file and write to uh, TMP. And now it doesn't work. And that's okay, because we denied everything. And you can see, well, converts complain that, uh, well, 
it cannot write uh, where it, it wants. It cannot read stuff first, but it will not be able to write it either. So, okay, we sandbox, but it's useless because it doesn't work. Uh, we need to add exceptions. We need to add rules. So, what is your status here? Do you all have the same stuff? Great. Let's move on. Now we'll add, we'll define a first rule. Uh, this one will be uh, to allow access to all the libraries and stuff that convert my use. Um, so it is about um, allowing slash USR. And yeah, for that we need to open it, get the file descriptor in this rule struct, and then um, well, define this rule with the access, um, mostly execute, read file, and write, and read directory. And all this is defined with the accessfs roughly, roughly uh, read. So let's do that. Um, yeah, you can print some stuff if you want. Um, Not a good one. Okay. Uh, now cre let's create uh, the struct. Okay. And this one again is defined the landlock file, landlock.h file, well, which also includes. Um, a file which is provided by your distro this time. Uh, we can take a look quickly at this file. It is um, it should be in uh, USR includes Linux landlock, and that is yeah once again provided by your distro, and it contains uh, the relevant bit for the run bits for your space. So uh, struct definitions, you can uh, find it again. Uh, the Lana Group set ATTR. Uh, you can find uh, the um, Lana path bin is ATTR with the two fields. And you can also find all the access rights which are defined here. Okay, um, let's populate this rule. So I uh, will add first. Uh, the brown file descriptor, so the root of the file hierarchy. And you don't need to, but it's a good thing to do. It's to use the opath flag. Um, opath is used to reference a file, but you cannot do anything with this file descriptor except reference it for some syscalls, and Lanoc is one of them. Um, so yeah, you don't need to, uh, to open this directory and to be able to read the content. You just need to be able to tell to the kernel that I want this directory to be a load, to reference this directory. Yeah, and o'clock is, like, is always good. Um, now let's add the access rights. So once again, this typo here. Um, I guess you can take a look quickly because I did a copy past and that should be a load access, not uh, handle access FS. But it's good in the patch. Um, okay. So we should allow a read in this directory, and that's it. Now let's load this rule. Let add this rule to the rule set. With the Lanac add rule syscall. 
So uh, we identify the set with file descriptor. We tell the kernel that it is a pass pin tool. And yeah, you put the root there. If everything goes wrong, uh, let's print an error message. Okay, and all that, well, there's a mistake here, should be before using the old set, of course. So I added that uh, at the end, but as you can see on the slide, it should be before the PSTL call, of course. So let's move this code up. Okay. So let's recap. We define a rule set. We create a rule set, file descriptor. We define a rule. We populate the rule. And we add this rule to the rule set. And then we call PSTL and Nalang Risk itself to enforce this rule set on the current set. So now we have kind of a small sandbox, but that would make sense. So it will not work because, well, some stuff will work, but you will not have access to uh, the input file, of course, but we can still test that and make sure that it built well. It does, apparently. Is everything okay for everyone? Good. Let's continue. So now we'll add more rules. So let let make some room here. Um, so of course, when you're developing stuff, you want to factor out code and so on. For the tutorial, it would be much more easy to just do copy pass of the same code. Um, but if you want to, you can improve this code, of course. Um, so that was it for the first exception, the first rule, and now let's add another one. Because if you execute this, you'll see some issues probably. But yeah, we can test it. Um, we can test it. Um, yeah, so it works. Uh, the rule was added. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can, you still cannot um, read and write um, uh, the input file and write to the output file. That's okay. Um, so yeah, let's copy this block and add a new rule. This time it not, will not be uh, to, uh, for slash user, but for slash dev null, because that might be used internally. So we change the path, and um, we need to change the access right too. And this time we'll use a real uh, landlock access right, not uh, a group of them. So it will be uh, landlock um, access FS suite file. I think. Yes. because we, we want to be able to read DevNull because that might be used for, well, internal reasons. Um, that's it. Again, to be sure you can build to make sure that it works. And we'll go to the next part, which is to, which is to add uh, dynamic arguments. So dynamic uh, rule. That is a fun part. I hope. Um, okay, so once again, let's copy this block. And this time, so um, 
If you're curious, you took a look at the code before that, before where we are inserting code. And you can see that it's just the file name here. So this file name is the one which is passed as an input path. And so in our use case, in, in our case, it will contain the slash background exploit issues dot uh, mvg, I think. Um, so that's good. We need to, well, allow convert to read this file because yeah, that's what we want. Um, so yeah, let's use it. So let's replace the previous um, definal with uh, file name. Same here. We just we don't just print it. We just actually use it. That's better. And yeah, that's a bit. Uh, we want to be able to read it, and that's it. We don't want to, to write to the input file. Um, okay. And so this time we can also build again and test if it can read the file, which wasn't allowed before. So again, I'm using, well, of course, the utilities slash convert version, not the version which is in top. So new error message you see. Um, so what is interesting is um, permission deny most of the time. Um, there is no more before there was uh, permission denied to access the input file, convert enable to open image here, permission denied, and that is gone now. You can see that we create we created three rules, slash user for slash user, slash dev null, and the input file, which is dynamic. So that's great. You cannot define that in a system-wide policy because, well, that's static. Um, so I think is almost good. Uh, the only issue is that this tool cannot write on the output file, which is unfortunate. So let's add that. Um, once again, let's copy this block. The add rule block will change file name with something else. And the something else is mostly that. So um, I didn't mention that, but I, I should have. Image magic is kind of written uh, special way. Um, it pass arguments as long as it reads them, which is okay, but it also interprets arguments um, when it reads them. So there's actual computational code near the argument passing, and as much as the, uh, well, the convert will read the, the CLI arguments, it, do, it does stuff. So that is not really clean, and that is, yeah, an issue for different reasons. And one of them is, uh, well, it is more difficult to maintain, to evolve, and also to patch. But we can still do that here. Um, and so, yeah, it's a bit weird to look at the output path like this, but it's a way image, image magic and convert do it. Um, you can just look at the code and you'll see how it, how it went. So, um, yeah, let's do it. The thing is, the output file doesn't exist when you execute the application. So the application will need to be able to write to the directory. Okay? So we cannot just Low, well, open the destination file that doesn't exist yet. We need to open the directory that should exist and then um, add exception to this directory. So let's do that. Um, 
let's get the output path first properly. Okay. Now let's get the uh, dear name of this one. And now let's replace the file names with out dear. And we need to change the access rights for this specific word. Um, you need to be able to write on it. So, and I'm not sure, but maybe read read on it too. But we can try first with only the right access. Um, so it should be something like, yeah, like this. Okay, so that should be it. Um, maybe there's some stuff that convert needs to do on the directory, like listing the content, but we'll see that just now. Except in my not build, because I guess there's a missing header. Be, looks fine. Great. Um, yeah, let's test it. Yeah, cool, then. That's not good. So, um, if we trace it, we can get an idea of what's going on. Um, and Oh, yeah, it's not one plus one, it's i plus one. Thank you. Yeah, so you can see here this um, dear name is not known. Uh, that's okay. So let's take a look at what we need for that. It's here. No. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, Um, so if you take a look at the, the main page, uh, you can see that we need to have the include libgen.h either. So let's add it. At the top, like here, instance. And that should be it. Okay, no warning anymore. Let's try it. And it looks like there's an issue. Uh, there's another permission denied because Convert tried to do something. If we had an audit feature, we could, we, we could know what's going on exactly. But otherwise, you can uh, just use uh, a trace and take a look. We can actually, um, yeah. And you can see uh, that it tries to uh, well open the TMP out.png. So it means that it needs read and write access to the content of the directory. So let's add it. So I just uh, did a copy of uh, these access groups. So we not we now have oh sorry, access fs roughly read and roughly write for again uh, the output directory. That should be it. I will come later if you need to take a look, but everything is in the patch again, number six.
Okay, let's try to convert it again without a trace this time. And there is something interesting going on here. Um, the execution went well. Um, there's still some issues with convert, but um, oh, it is enable to open this file, right? Uh, let's make sure of that. It did write on this file, so that's good. Um, and what you can see is um, the exploit is still executed, which is okay, but um, it cannot read the private key. So the application is still vulnerable, but we limited the impact of such vulnerability to only the output directory and to read the input file, mainly. Is that okay for everyone? Did you succeed to patch it this way? Or do you want me to show it again? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the structure only passes pretty much two fields. So why didn't the API just incorporate those extra two fields in the API? Why the requirement to have the extra structure? Um, so there's three syscalls, right? So what do you call ABI exactly? When you're passing the structure. Yeah. Pointer, right? So that means yeah. that you're passing the structure to yeah. shared memory instead of passing it to the function call. Oh yeah, so yeah, so that's for um, extensibility, yeah, flexibility reasons, to be able to extend it later, and because, well, arguments are kind of limited. For instance, uh, you cannot pass a uh, 64-bit value uh, because that's the way it is for compatibility reasons and so on. Um, so if you need to pass something else than only a 32-bit value you need to have pointer. And yeah, the beauty with this API is that you can pass pointer to a struct, and because you specify the size of the struct, it can evolve over time. And if you don't feel the struct, even if, if the size of the struct change, but if the trading part is filled with zeros, it will work even with uh, other canons. So, yeah, so that was a question I, I asked myself, yes, and I think it's not a good thing um, because you, as a user of this API, you don't really care about the ABI, about the version. You care about features. You want to restrict this and that, okay? And if you want to deal with ABI compatibility, you want to use an a library that will handle that better than you could because some people spend some time in it, and that's the idea. So, yeah, that's why it is really simple. The kernel can just return an ABI version, then the use space library can do whatever it wants. It it find good for the goal of yeah. sandbox thing. Yes, right. And it's much simpler for the kernel too, which is good. Okay, so I guess everyone almost did patch the application, so that's good. Um, again, all the solutions are in the patches, which is provided. Um, you can install it if you want on your system with these commands. Um, and this time you'll have on your system, on your virtual machine. Uh, the patch version. Okay, and um, here are some existed left if you want to continue that. Well, of course, that was a workshop, so 
Uh, the idea is to make it simple to explain. I hope it was okay. Um, but of course, you may want to add some loops here to have more, add more complex tricks to uh, pack the pass and the access right and so on, and then build something more uh, flexible. Um, convert, image magic convert, also supports some uh, specific uh, scheme like FD, and that can also um, work uh, with Landlock. Um, you might want to support more comments than only convert and also more arguments because that is kind of uh, strict here. Uh, well, if you want to go further, you can build your own kernel, add audit support and uh, test. And for your own application, if you want to patch it, uh, we're working on a set of tools uh, to make this easier and especially to make it easier to test your applications on different kernel versions. And that some kernel versions that may not support unlock and that some that may support a subset of it and, that, and others that may support all the new features. So, and that is really convenient to put that in a CI and to know when you're developing your library, your application that, well, it will work well, whatever the kernel version you're using. Well, your users are using. And yeah, if you want to go on, you can send patches of stream. Uh, I didn't try to. Uh, yeah, it's left uh, as an exercise. Okay, let's wrap up. So what does uh, this patch? Um, so this patch is to sandbox a native CLI application, and it deals with, well, the native arguments. So whenever you will run this application, if the kernel supports handlock, it will be sandbox. You don't need to have any specific uh, configuration for the system, any system-wide policy, you just need to run your application. So if it doesn't support unlock, uh, well, you should check that and just not try to sandbox because it will fail, of course. Um, but if the current kernel do support unlock, well, uh, you can use it in sandbox uh, the code. I guess it was quite uh, quick to implement this first proof of concept. Um, even if, well, there's more time required to understand where to patch to find the sweet spot, but that is doable. And it's even quicker with your application, of course, because you know it. So that's much more easier. Um, if you want to contribute, there's a lot of stuff to do, uh, either on the kernel side or your space side. There's a Rust library, Go library, Haskell library, all the stuff that. There's also some tools using it. Um, you can take a look at the website, nonlog.io and on the GitHub, and yeah, look for Landlock on GitHub, you'll see. Um, if you want to test, to challenge the implementation, feel free. And um, yeah, there's still some improvement to do for the documentation. And of course, well, uh, what I can suggest you is to sandbox your application and others. If you want some motivation, well, there's some rewards program, so that might be a good thing to do. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now or later. There's almost no one sleeping, which is good. <laughs> Yeah, so my, my question is, would it be possible to apply this type of sandboxing on top of a binary without recompiling the binary directly? So you would create a wrapper binary that mm -hmm. would then load the secondary binary to sandbox it, apply the, uh, the landlock um, permissions on the top one, and then the, it would load the second binary and launch into it with those restrictions in place so that way you don't have to recompile your target. 
Yes, definitely. So um, that is uh, so one goal of Landlog is to be able to not only sandbox your application but create sandboxes like Container Manager or even uh, like applications which are designed to sandbox stuff uh, like Flatpak or whatever, Bubble for App and so on. And yes, you can do that. Um, I can do a quick demo. I did did the same uh, in the previous talk, um, but I can do it here. Um, so yeah, if you go in the samples landlock directory in the kernel source tree, uh, you'll see this uh, sandboxer file. And when you execute it, you'll see uh, well the configuration. So, um, so let's try to. Um, yes, good. Okay. So let's just copy the default, the example configuration. So in this case, uh, yeah, I'm launching the sandbox application, which is patched with Sandlock. Will sandbox itself according to a configuration here in the environment variables. It could be a file, whatever you want. And then launch, well, what I put here, so bash, in this case. And that's it. I'm in sandbox. Well, there's an error here, but it's an error from bash because you cannot read, uh, well, the home directory, but that's okay. You cannot read that. Okay, but I can still read the TMP directory, but I can read the slash directory and so on. Got it. Thanks. Okay. So, thank you.